Good morning all and welcome to Partner Week. Um, today I have with me Eva Jusson Lindqvist, who's the project manager for the Data Factory. Yes. And data is really the key word for the first day of this edition for Partner Week. So Eva, who are you and what will we do today? Uh, I am project manager for the Data Factory here at AI Sweden. And today, as you said, we will focus on data and data is crucial. And that's what we will hear more about today. What's the value of data? What are the challenges that you face with data? So we have invited some really interesting speakers, some of our partner organizations. So we have Sensact, we have AstraZeneca, Scaleout, we have Viking Analytics and DocuSign, or SEAL software, as they were called before, um, to join us and share their insights, their perspective on data and how they work with it. Yeah, yeah. And my name is Peter Kurzweli. Uh, you might recognize the both of us if you were uh, attended the previous Partner Week we had uh, during the spring. Uh, but this year, we or this time, we want to focus on what we see as our new model of working or, or our new model of, of kind of explaining why we need to bring different competences together. And that's also something that we're going to highlight uh, during the day because the first day here today is about the data and the data expertise. We will go through, as Eva said, the, the crucial parts mm. of data for developing applied AI. Uh, but then tomorrow we will go into the tech day because uh, tech is obviously very important for data, but especially machine learning. So we will dive deeper into the field of machine learning and understand a bit more about federated learning and also talk a lot about edge. Yep. Um, and then on Thursday, we will talk of the, about the business side of AI, because there's really a need to increase the level of competence and really, uh, really start talking about AI in a broader sense in terms of business and domain knowledge. So we need to spread the word and spread competence and knowledge around AI. And because what we do here at AI Sweden is, is really our mission is to accelerate applied AI in both public and private sector. Uh, so uh, we have a, a, diff range, a, range, a broad range of, of product offerings and we will talk about them some uh, in some parts mm. of the program, but mostly we want to focus on the AI ecosystem we do have in Sweden and what our partners are doing both in themselves, but also together. And I'm really looking forward to that. And as part of the offering that we have for our partner is, for example, the data factory, which is one really also, of course, crucial infrastructure needed for AI development. So the data factory entails, for example, compute and storage facilities for partners and for projects to use. But it's also more than that. More importantly, it's also a test bed for data factory solutions, meaning how to develop and explore the AI infrastructure needed. And we invite our partners to use both the tested and the compute and storage to make Sweden accelerate on how we develop the data factory solutions as well. And I think that's really, really interesting and something unique for AI Sweden, where we offer these opportunities to develop uh, the infrastructure needed for AI. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what we want to have as a theme for the, the partner week is, is curious, uh, action, uh, curious actionables. Uh, so, so please stay curious, ask a lot of questions, and be sure to connect with us. Use us, join us in, in our force. Because uh, one thing that we mentioned earlier is that what we do is that we invest together, but we try to share with all. Uh, so that all of you can benefit from from different insights, different different experiences. Uh, so please use the chat function and the Q and A function in Zoom. Ask a lot of questions to the uh, panelists because we will bring them up. We will do have panels. So so please uh, join us in this effort of, of accelerating applied AI all over Sweden. But let's jump right into the program. We will have our first speaker, and who is that? Eva? Yes, it's our board sponsor for the Data Factory. It's Mats Nordlund from Sensact, who will talk about why is data crucial. So good morning and welcome, Mats. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Mats Nordlund. I'm the director of research at Sensact, and I'm also the board sponsor for the National Data Factory at AI Sweden. Today, I'm going to talk on the topic of why is data crucial? Um, 
when we use the word crucial, we most often think of something as being in a positive sense that we absolutely need this and this is essential for something. But if you look up the definition of the word crucial, uh, it comes out to be decisive or critical, especially in the success or failure of something. If you were to translate that into Swedish, you would say that nothing står or faller med detta. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to take the alternative look at data. How can it make us fail so that we try to avoid that? When we look at data in literature, and most often when we talk about data, we will get something like what you can see here. Data is the new oil or the new electricity, the oxygen, the new soil or the new gold. And that is for a good reason. Every minute in our lives right now, <clears throat> internet produces four and a half million gigabytes of data. We, we make about four and a half million Google searches. We have something like 18 million text messages. And collectively, we watch about 694,000 hours on Netflix. There are many other data points you can gather, as you can see in this picture. The point is that a lot of data is generated. <clears throat> and it's not only generated by ourselves on the internet, but we also have a lot of devices Internet of Things devices, cars, cell phones, and other things that generate data. And one of the colleagues at Sensac, Matthias Brennström, he proposed a different view on data. Uh, when we do data mining, it's almost like diamond mining. There's so much data or so much gray rock around that it's almost hard to find the small pieces of really valuable data that we might want. Of course, there are different data applications. Sometimes you just want to have a big set of data and make statistics on it and so forth. But many times we're looking for some specific data cases or specific pieces of data, corner cases or, or something else that we want to use to train our, <clears throat> train our algorithms. When you look at diamond mining, what you have to go through there is 10 tons of rocks in a diamond mine to find one grams of diamond. That's a 10 million to one ratio. And it might be the same in many of the cases when we are looking at data. If we, for example, look at what we do in the automotive industry, we collect a lot of data from the roads when we are out with our um, data collection vehicles. And we use this data to train our algorithms. One of our vehicles <clears throat> has about eight cameras. It has a number of leaders. It has ultrasonics and radars and so forth. And every second, we collect about four gigabit of data in one of these cars. It's also been projected that next year, every person on average will generate about 1.7 megabytes of data per second. And that's, of course, through our cell phones, through our activities on the internet, and also by using cars, for example, not as sophisticated as this one, but our regular cars also collect a lot of data. And by the way, just for fun, this is one of the deep fake images that's been generated by other data. So this person doesn't exist, but it's a photo that's been generated by an algorithm that's been trained on a lot of other uh, photos, of course. But if we look at the data situation, what you can see on this slide here is the growth of data produced per month. How many exabytes are we generating per month on the average? And you can see it's a 50% compounded annual growth rate over the last five years. And if you look on the diagram on the right side, <clears throat> what you can see here is how much energy this data processing consumes by just internet. And then of course we have uh, data processing in the industry. We have other uh, data processing as well, banks and travel um, manufacturing and whatnot. And what you can see here is that the two scenarios, the two blue lines, one is uh, showing the low case and one showing the high case. And what if you if we were to, to use the high case in energy consumption, what we'll see is that the internet alone is going to consume more energy that, than all the energy that's produced in the world by around 2030. Of course, this is unsustainable. We cannot keep doing or treating data the way we have been because it cannot last. There are three, three key areas which uh, makes it difficult or that prevents us from going forward and that's cost there's a lot of transfer cost storage cost and processing cost uh, we see an emerging set of new regulations that 
put boundaries on what we can and cannot do when it comes to exchanging and transferring data. One example is the GDPR in Europe, but there are other examples in other countries as well. And then of course, security. There is a lot of concerns around manipulation of data, stealing data and so forth. So it's clear that we can't keep going the way we are. So something has to happen, but we are indeed facing a number of paradoxes. I listed them here uh, to make it clear what it is we're looking at. We say that we want more data, but at the same time, we want less data. Um, we want to share our data, but we also want to keep it private. We want to transfer data, but for various reasons, we might have to keep it locally. So when you express it this way, typically what we do here in Sweden, we have a magic word that's called lagom, which means just right. And what we would apply then is that we, when it comes to the amount of data we want, we want lagom data and we want to share it lagom and we want to transfer it in a lagom fashion, sort of a just right fashion. In, in engineering terms, you would say it's sort of, you try to optimize, so you try to compromise. So you, <clears throat> you don't transfer all the data you need, but you, you don't transfer all the data you don't need. So you end up sort of in, in compromise situations, which really aren't all that good. So <clears throat> when you end up in a situation like this, maybe we should ask ourselves slightly different questions or look at the problem from a different perspective. <clears throat> so instead, how about asking these questions? Data is typically born on the edge, meaning out in your cell phone or in the cars or in the IoT devices or, or somewhere out. Why don't we keep it there? Can we find technology that enables it to stay on the edge? We also say that we want to aggregate the data, collect it into one central point, but do we really need to aggregate the data? Don't we, could we not instead aggregate the knowledge? Meaning that we process the data out somewhere and then the processed data, which is the knowledge, we can aggregate that, that probably is a lot less. We've been at Sansac looking at trends, what's going on in the storage and compute field for many years. <clears throat> and today we are on the far left. We use uh, in our company anyway, uh, centralized storage and compute facility. We move all the data into one place um, and a big storage facility it can be represented by the tank here. And then we process it in a, in a large centralized computing facility. The next step on this trend is that we're looking at setting up several locations and instead of moving all the data and in, in reality in some cases you can't take data out of some countries. So we actually do have to set up compute facilities there and then we would like to process data in several locations and then bring it together the process data the algorithms not the data but the results of the process data. And uh, this is published and discussed rather widely um, in terms of federated learning. The next step after that is when you try to do all the training on the edge. You move all the algorithms out to your devices and you train it on local data. And then you transfer all the trained algorithms to one of these nodes and let them federate there and then send it back out again. And then you can repeat that cycle over and over. This is referred to as swarm learning or mesh learning. And it seems like a very interesting approach. And maybe the future holds a combination of these three. But if we use all these three different topologies or these three layouts, it might simplify our lives quite a bit. And that is something that's quite interesting to us to see if we can build a future on some combination of these. So on my last slide, the question was, why is data crucial? If we take the diamond analogy, we've been looking a lot for natural diamonds. And of course, it takes a lot of processing. We crush a lot, lot of rocks. But technology over the last many years on the diamond side have improved so much on the industrial diamonds, on the synthetic diamonds, that right now we can actually produce synthetic diamonds that have the same quality and are very, very difficult to distinguish from natural diamonds. I have a feeling that we're going to see a similar development on the data side, that there is going to be completely new approaches coming into the data field that prevents us from 
keep running in a direction that seems unsustainable. And the advice I would say, and the way I'm looking at it, is that we need to disrupt the big data trend and the central processing. There's got to be a better way to do it. And we're certainly looking at some of it. And there's got to be ways that we can aggregate knowledge instead of aggregating data. <clears throat> there are a lot of exciting initiatives going on around the world. One of them is at AI Sweden, where in not many days, uh, we will open together with the HPE and a few other uh, partners, a new edge lab, which will make it possible for us who are members here to explore the possibilities of this new technology. And with that, I'd like to pass it back on to Ebba and Peter uh, so that we can have colleagues from other companies come in here and, and tell many of the exciting things that are going on there. If you want to know more, uh, contact Ebba or, or let us know at Zansact and we'd be happy to discuss with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mats. Um, that's great. It's really good to hear your perspective on this and, and showing the different questions that you have to ask yourself about how much data you need and how to collect it. And we will spin off on that uh, topic throughout the day a bit more. And we'll see you much uh, in the panel discussion at 9.15. So thank you very much. And we will now welcome Alan Sabrish from uh, AstraZeneca. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good to, good to have you on Partner Week. Thank you for joining Hi. us. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, you will tell us a little bit about the, the uh, challenge or the hackathon that was uh, going on a couple of uh, weeks ago or started a couple of weeks ago and just finished last week. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, we really look forward to hearing some of your thoughts from, from that. Yeah, okay. So please go ahead and share your screen and uh, start when, whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. We will make sure that we can see it from here. How's that look? That looks Perfect. great. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about AstraZeneca fat data or AstraZeneca fat data um, because what we're going to talk about is literally fat. Um, my, I, I work as a principal scientist uh, in a department called Advanced Drug Delivery, and this uh, little artistic representation down at the bottom of the slide is showing nanoparticles, and uh, we use those to deliver uh, mRNA uh, to the skin. And this is all over the news at the moment because of COVID. So uh, several of the COVID vaccines work this way. And um, you have to give these particles to the skin, as I'll show you. And so this is uh, uh, happens to be very uh, uh, timely as well. And so you're going to learn a little bit about uh, how vaccines work uh, indirectly. Uh, but I got a list of uh, questions from uh, Ebba so, to sort of structure this talk around. So I'm going to use those and I'm going to go through uh, uh, the, the data and, and what we did. Uh, so maybe I can get this to move. There we go. So the purpose of the uh, challenge and um, the results that were provided was the, the sort of uh, first question that she wanted me to ask here. And so uh, this it is a little bit of uh, graphic information about the purpose of this challenge. And as I mentioned, uh, at AstraZeneca, we, we uh, build nano machines. And uh, the nano machines look like this. They look like little balls, and they have a number of different components. And each one of these components has a specific function. Uh, and most of it is, is um, related to delivering the cargo. And in the particular case of this hackathon, the cargo that we were delivering was uh, an mRNA molecule. So your DNA is uh, red and it's turned into mRNA and that's turned into protein. And this particular protein uh, coded for a fluorescent green protein so we could see it. Uh, this is interesting because we take these nanomedicines and we inject them into the skin, as you see down here at the bottom left. And uh, that's called a subcutaneous injection. And the nanomedicines go into the skin. Uh, they uh, deliver their cargoes to cells in the skin, and the cells there start making uh, proteins. And um, one of the cells that is in the skin is uh, fat, adipocytes, um, fat cells. And that's just below the, the sort of uh, outer layer, the dermis of the uh, skin. And this is typically where you give vaccines as well. Uh, we don't, uh, in this case, we were not uh, so interested in a vaccine. This data set 
predates uh, COVID and, and this kind of thing. Um, here, in this case, we're interested in, in using the mRNA as a therapeutic. So it will make a protein that your body needs. In this case, we didn't use uh, uh, actual skin. Uh, we take some uh, fat from patients and we take the stem cells out of the fat and then we differentiate the stem cells back into adipocytes. And so up at the top right here, you have sort of a range of models of increasing complexity where you start with uh, cell cultures and then you have more complex cell cultures and then you have the actual sort of skin organ. And we're sort of in the middle there uh, where we have a, a complex uh, co-culture of cells. And the actual data um, looks like this, and th uh, the picture down at the bottom right, and, and, and this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. Um, so the fat cells look like bunches of grapes. Uh, the green blobs in them here are uh, the lipid droplets where your fat cells store energy for your body. Uh, and the blue objects are the nuclei that contain the genetic information, the instructions for each cell. And then the red is showing sort of the cell body. And normally we image this with fluorescence uh, microscopy and uh, we analyze lots of stuff about these uh, cells because it tells us things about how the nanomedicines are working. The point with the hackathon was to image these using a different method, which is shown on the left, where you take just white light and a regular microscope and you image them. And, and we can do this in, in sort of uh, vertical directions. So we get sort of a stack of images that go up through the, the cells. Uh, and we ask people to derive the picture on the right from the picture on the left. Uh, and this has several advantages because it means we don't have to use intensive laser light to activate the fluorescence. We also don't have to label the cells with fluorescent dyes and this sort of thing. Uh, so it's safer for the cells, uh, so they work better. Uh, but also so that we can um, use those fluorescent channels to make other sorts of analysis. So we can pull out much more data from, from this. This is also a generalized problem within AstraZeneca. So uh, we have several initiatives that are um, intended to derive fluorescence imaging from, or fluorescent images from bright field images. Uh, so this is, this is something we're interested in in, in a variety of uh, ways uh, and so the next question that Eva asked me was why AstraZeneca decided on sharing the data and, and making uh, a challenge out of it. And uh, this is this is uh, really interesting, I think, uh, especially when you're thinking about you know what kind of data to share and how much data you have. And I I think it's uh, I'm I'm one of the people who make uh, data, and I spend a lot of time thinking about the best way to make data for AI. And people, I, I, the, the title of this talk, AstraZeneca Fat Data, is, is kind of interesting because people think of AstraZeneca as this sort of data trove, you know, that we must have enormous amounts of data that, you know, if we, we could just access that data, we would drive all sorts of interesting relationships. And, and that's what our managers think too. They think, you know, oh, we've, we've got all this data, we can just like dump it onto some AI and it will figure stuff out. And, I find that really interesting because my experience is that usually the um, success of any sort of AI analysis is fairly proportional to how well you design the data that goes into it. And uh, I have the advantage of being an experimental scientist, so I can actually tailor the data to the AI. Um, and in this case, we had a good data set that had been the result of several sort of iterations where we have been designing data sets for AI and we, and we had this and we thought it would make a good challenge. Um, we built it originally for some internal stuff, but uh, it didn't get resourced. So this was an interesting opportunity to, to uh, work on it. And it, it had several advantages. It was extremely well uh, documented. So we had presentations like this, you know, that described the, the technical aspects of the data. Um, we had uh, metrics for uh, analyzing the results. We had uh, really sort of well-structured and, and, and well-documented um, data in terms of the metadata and, and that kind of thing. But what's really interesting about it, I think, is that it's self-annotating. Um, 
a lot of the problems we have in uh, biology anyway is, is with annotation. And presumably this is very familiar to a lot of you. But this one is neat because we had the, the bright field image stacks and then we had the fluorescence image stacks of the same field of view. So we knew sort of this is what we want and this is what we have. And we didn't actually have to annotate anything uh, because you just sort of had uh, both in the same data set that was generated by the same microscope. So it was, it was very convenient in that respect. Um, and it's also a relevant problem, as I mentioned, because we use this therapeutically. We do actually have projects that are doing this. And then of course, we're also making uh, um, vaccines using uh, these sorts of technologies. Uh, so what were the benefits uh, for AstraZeneca from uh, doing this challenge was the next question. And um, this, is this is also sort of interesting. I, you know, uh, maybe if AstraZeneca was a, a smaller company, um, it would be more important for us as a business, you know, that it would be more important that we were, uh, you know, actually getting solid results out of this and this sort of thing. But we don't actually regard it that way usually. It, it, this particular interaction is as much a community service as anything. Uh, we release this data because we want people to work on it. We want to encourage the community and we want um, to, to build the networks with the community and this sort of thing. Um, we also wanted to get some input about how uh, the rest of the AI community would solve this problem. As I said, we do have internal efforts in this direction, um, but it's, it's a useful way to sort of uh, benchmark those efforts and also to see, you know, just what other people are doing and what they come up with. And it was super interesting. Um, we also wanted to implement it more quickly than would have been possible if we did it with internal uh, efforts. Uh, I mentioned about the networks. Uh, we'll probably uh, eventually get publications out of this, which um, that's a, a sort of a bonus that wasn't uh, necessary, but uh, it is something that we, um, strive to do at AstraZeneca. We publish a lot. Um, so, so that's uh, uh, important for us. And then I think maybe from a more crass uh, business perspective, the last one is quite interesting. The, the, the prize sum was 5,000 US dollars. And so there, we selected eight teams with an average of about four people a team. Uh, they worked say 12 hours a day, I would, <laughs> maybe more uh, for 14 days. And that gives you um, a little more than 5,000 working hours. Uh, so if you divide the working hours by the cost, uh, you get something that is a long ways under minimum wage. Um, so we got uh, an incredible amount of uh, input from some of Sweden's best and brightest uh, for a very modest uh, investment. And uh, this was very appealing to our, our managers not at the beginning, but actually at the end when they realized what it was that they had gotten. Um, and I, th I think that's um, uh, interesting. It's not interesting to me personally, but uh, it, you, you might find that um, some of you might find that uh, interesting. Uh, the last two things here, uh, what collaborations do you hope for and uh, how can this contribute to our research? Uh, I'll just uh, mention without any slides here. Um, so, uh, as I said, we, we want to build networks uh, and uh, we will continue to collaborate with uh, um, several of the groups that uh, perform the best in, in this hackathon. Uh, many of the groups we had interactions with already, um, but this has given us uh, some new uh, um, avenues for uh, collaboration that, I, that we will use uh, definitely. Uh, and then, uh, we will also implement this in our research. So um, basically the thought is to bolt this into our microscopy system. So the data will flow out of the microscopes through these uh, uh, deep learning algorithms to generate these uh, uh, fluorescence images uh, computationally. Uh, and then those will flow into our regular uh, analytical flows for data extraction and that sort of thing. Uh, so it, it is very, very applied. Uh, we will uh, use this in active ongoing projects. So that's it. I hope I managed uh, within time. I wasn't paying attention to the time, so I hope I didn't babble too much. But uh, uh, really interesting hackathon. Really, really enjoyed it. 
Uh, and um, I think uh, we definitely got a taste for it. So we'll pr try and do some more of them. Thank you, Alan. Uh, really great to hear your um, your perspectives of doing this challenge, uh, the challenge. And I know there was a lot of work also put in from your side, and it, it took mm -hmm. some time to to plan and and work the event. And also, since COVID happened, <clears throat> it was planned to be happening in May, and it was postponed till October. Uh, so of course that uh, did uh, there were some changes happening, but it worked really well to do it online. Uh, as well. And I just wanted to ask you, was there something that really surprised you that you didn't expect uh, from before that actually happened or a result or something like that? Um, <laughs> well, it's kind of a kind of a funny thing, but I was surprised how much fun it was. Um, it like um, it was a lot of work. And I think the amount of work you put into these things uh, is proportional to their success um, because we we did put a lot of effort into making a very structured, very clear question with very structured and clear metrics for success, and and I think this this made it easier and more uh, successful in the end. Uh, but that was a lot of work, and we focused for a long time on that um, and. Uh, you know, the when the when the actual hackathon came along, it it was for me because I'd been working on it for so long. It was almost like a sort of an afterthought, and and it started, and all of this interesting stuff happened. And I'd been so focused on the preparations that I was sort of like, oh wow, this is <laughs> this is really interesting, <laughs> and and um, and so that that was that was surprising. And I think also that. Um, the quality of the results um, exceeded our expectations. Um, the 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 best performing teams uh, produced uh, a result that I regard kind of as magical. <laughs> I, it, it was it was really uh, really impressive, really impressive. Well, that's really great to hear. Yeah. I think that's really what you could, yeah. if you could even hope for it. Yes, uh, exactly. That kind of result yeah. is, mm -hmm. is really something to be happy about. Yep. And and uh, really, thank you so much for sharing these experience. We really want to encourage and inspire other partners to do the same. And I also just want to say that we, we still have the data set and it's actually uh, available for, for other research groups, for example, uh, to continue this kind of research. Um, so that's really interesting. And we look forward to continue working with you on it and, and with the teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Really, Thanks a lot. This project really shows that because I know the discussion kind of intensified after the last partner week we had, uh, and this really shows what 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 happens when a organization or a company dares to be brave because last time we talked a lot about bravery a lot about mm. challenging the ecosystem doing things together and, and i think astrazeneca and the work you've done here alan is is really inspiring and i hope it inspires more of our partners to open up to share their data and to to open up data sets so that other parts of the ecosystem can can build real solutions so so this is a challenge yeah. towards the all of the uh, the attendees here and all of the other partners we do have uh, just join us connect with us uh, about this and, and really look into your organizations what type of data sets you can share and then we can really build a hackathon that will provide real solutions that you can apply in your daily operations so this is super inspiring Thank you, Alan, so much. You're welcome. And if you, if you uh, want to and can stay on till the panel discussion at 9.15, uh, then we'll see you then. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll hang around for that. Uh, I think that'll be really interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have our next speaker, Tania Sakrisson from uh, Scaleout. Yes, hello. One of our uh, startup companies. Uh, great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I can just get going, I think. Um, so machine learning is really about learning from data, but the problem uh, is that many companies really cannot use the data they in principle already have. So in this short presentation, I will introduce one aspect of this that we call the data access challenge. So I'll share my screen now and um, go through this a uh, little bit. 
Here we go. That should be it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, my name is Daniel. I'm the CEO of Scaleout. And we are a um, AI Sweden startup partner focused on machine learning and ML ops on distributed infrastructure. What that is, yeah, we can get into some other time. But we're mainly involved with AI Sweden in the federated learning testbed project. Um, but we're also working with a lot of both small and large companies, um, especially either around the data access or um, around taking machine learning to production. Uh, so that's basically this. But I would like to start off here somewhere where that Mats also mentioned that you can look at data as one of the most valuable resources now. now and that is because uh, the most valuable companies today are really based on data and the most value is created uh, out of products based on data uh, so in some ways you can see it as the new oil but uh, they're all it's also different from oil or, or electricity in many ways so for example data can be used many many times and it actually becomes more valuable the more it is used we can also replicate data very, very easily and at low, low cost. And that only becomes a problem when you have huge data sets. Uh, but there are also some really like fundamental downsides. So if you lose a batch of data and you might only lose a batch of data once, and that might be the end of your entire business. So security also becomes also super important. Um, and so we would like, or we like to like, uh, then put the, what we call the, here, the data access challenge in relation to this. And, and we think that the, the, one of the main problems is that uh, most of the valuable data out there is isolated in different forms. So we have three main types of, of data that is in this way. So we have isolated data, that's data we don't want to share. So that might be private data, we, don't, uh, we might have collaborations with partners, but we don't want to share data. We think that this data can be misused or it can be lost by someone else. We also have a lot of regulated data that we are not allowed either to share or to move. So we have, for instance, personal data and GDPR. We have a lot of health data um, and regulations around health data. We have data export regulations, also something that uh, Mats and Nolan mentioned. Um, and we also have lots of uh, classified and un uh, controlled unclassified information, as it's called in Sweden. And the last third big block of data that we really cannot uh, share or that we consider isolated is, uh, um, is, is blocked for practical reasons. And we, so we just cannot share that data. So for instance, we have high frequency data generated far out on the edge. We have IoT data. So there is uh, like low power sheet devices, but maybe are generating a lot more data than what they are really, uh, than we're able to handle considering their size and value. We have some very, very large data sets that are not practical to move. And we have a lot of situations where we have sensors uh, or, or other systems that are generating data, but are not connected to reliable networks. So um, why would we like to have access to all of this data? So because the, the real promise here is that if we would have more data, we could enable what we call the long tail of AI. So really where we're building use cases today is just the top tip of the iceberg. It's the accessible data. And we have some really, really big companies that are producing fantastic amounts of value out of the data they have. And we have some companies that do have massive amounts of data available. But we also have like front runners that are able to create valuable use cases out of the data that they do have. But most companies and most of the data is really not used for anything. And if we would be able to use this data, we could like unlock what is maybe 80 or 85 or 90% uh, more use cases uh, and create really a lot of value throughout like all levels of, of our, our businesses. Um, so when it comes to enabling access to data, uh, there are a few different methods that we can do this. So we can, um, uh, have like either a technical approach um, or uh, a legal approach to this. And 
Um, this is a summary of uh, it's uh, I, anyone who would like to have this link. This is the uh, UN actually, um, the United Nations did a good job and they've written a handbook for privacy preserving techniques that really um, goes through quite quite well how we can work with data in different forms and, and they um, uh, really summarize the problem of, of uh, privacy preservation which is how we would be able to access all of this data that is isolated in in three different ways so one way is uh, is through policy enforcement so that's the legal uh, approach um, you can you can write data sharing agreements or non-disclosure agreements with partners and share that data that way and be sure because there's legal backing to how you how you work with the data but you can also work with data as yes, from a tech, fundamental technical way. Um, and it, that is split basically into two ways. So we, they call it either input privacy or output privacy. Uh, so output privacy is that you, um, from whatever goes into training machine learning model, uh, you make it impossible to, um, to um, backtrack and learn about what data went into training the model. So and you ensure that by different methods. One of those methods is differential privacy, for instance, where you add statistical noise um, to, to your data. Um, the other way to do it is, is around input privacy. So that, that's where you do some operations to the data or, or handle data before it's even sent into uh, training the, the machine learning models from the beginning. So uh, Homomorphic encryption is one method where you encrypt all the data before you send it in and then you train models on encrypted data. You have something called zero knowledge proofs. Uh, and the last thing that I would like to like, do a super short introduction to is federated learning, which is the focus on the, of the federated learning project and also some uh, method that we believe a lot in and, and work a lot with. And that's basically where you um, turn the principle of machine learning around. So instead of collecting all the data to one place, you distribute the training of your machine learning models out to where the data is. So uh, you train many small machine learning models. For instance, you can do that in different hospitals. You train these models and then you collect them to, you collect the models uh, to one place and you aggregate the models together and you have one central model. So in essence, what you do is you, um, you share the knowledge or you, you work on learnings from data and you don't, you don't work on, on the data itself. Uh, so that's something that we typically call uh, a non-competitive environment. So these hospitals all want to collaborate, but uh, uh, it's, it's too, uh, we have too much regulations and it's too, too much trouble to do that as it is today. You can also use this in competitive environments. So one of the products we are working with is with Swiss Airlines and some other airlines uh, around um, flight traffic control. So where where the airlines um, they they have a common problem with their com competitors. They want to have better flight planning, um, and but none of these participants want to share any sensitive data because they think that all of the uh, their competitors here will misuse the data uh, and get a competitive edge over them. Uh, so here, what you end up with is a situation where the security uh, requirements are very, very high, but uh, as it looks like this is still a vi viable way to approach these problems. So that's really, really interesting. And that's also one of the focuses of, of, of the Federated Learning Testbed project. And then what is a little bit connected, the Edge Lab project that I, I'm sure will be uh, further discussed uh, during this partner week. So that was everything from me um, uh, for my short presentation. And, uh, but I'm really, really happy if anyone has more questions around data access or Federated Learning or privacy preservation in, in machine learning, just reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, that's really great. And what you were saying, Peter, here during your, your talk, how you nail down a kind of complicated concept with... With a simple definition or a much, much simpler definition. So, so explaining federated learning instead of uh, just 
reversing the, the process instead of taking in the data you take out the models mm -hmm. uh, i basically got ah that's a really good definition <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you so much daniel and you will join us also in the panel yes i will yeah that's great and and i, I just want to mention uh, we've seen uh, a couple of questions coming in uh, we will use the panel to to uh, to really bring up those questions and i saw uh, from from katarina there was a great question to to mats which i also think we want the other panelists to answer yeah. so so we will definitely uh, talk about all of the questions just so uh, you the attendees all know that uh, and by that uh, we want to welcome in sergio yes sergio welcome good morning Hello, good morning. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Petro, for the invitation to Viking Analytics to this event. We, we appreciate it a lot. <laughs> it's great to have you here and great to see Viking Analytics perspective on data. So we look forward to your presentation and it seems like we can see it. Now we see it perfectly. Ah, so, that's great. Uh, that's great. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. So a lot of times when we're working with machine learning projects or any applications, condition monitor, maintenance, or any other application as my previous speakers has shared. Usually the first question is like, okay, show me the data. Uh, and like you start getting lots and lots of data and, and plenty of data. But that's the question, having data is not exactly the same as information. Data, one can measure it quite easily. It's just a collection of zeros or ones. Uh, you can say, how much data have you collected? You can say, I have this many sensors collecting with this sampling rate, so I have this many megabytes uh, per day. However, information is a little bit more of a fuzzy concept. Um, you can say that it's kind of the insights that you get out of looking at this data. And it's more difficult to measure out of it. Um, once you have the data, you start to create information or you extract information out of it and you start to build the knowledge. You can start to see the relationship among the many different pieces of data. And these insights enable to build, okay, we had this problem, we had this input or we want this output. Now you start to see all these dots across the data. And now you can, as you develop the project, be able to reach from A to B as it is desired. Now, but the information, as I said, has a value, but it's kind of difficult to measure. There have been even mathematical definitions when information theory was first introduced, was trying to, to reach that. And we came to realize that the amount of information that an event provides is related to the probability on an event. The, most, the more unlikely this event is, the more information it will contain. We see these two sentences, and we can see that both of these sentences have the same number of characters, and it will be expected that it will have the same number of bits, zeros and ones. However, the second one provides more information than the first one. When you think Kiruna, like, okay, it's not surprising that there is a snow, like it will be surprising if there is no snow, but there is always snowing in Kiruna from August to June. While if you were to hear like, okay, there's plenty of snow in Madrid, it's like, okay, that's, that's surprising, but you will not expect that. Uh, so there's more information on the second one. Now, you reach the project, you start to define the project, and usually what happens is that, okay, now I need more data. Why? Because the data that you had before, it was, well, perhaps it didn't have the amount of information that you needed to make your project a reality, and then you start to ask, like, well, let's get more data. Now, the question, so it becomes, is like, was the collected data from the machines or from the process actually provided something useful. In a lot of times we can think about it as uh, companies, organizations, they do have a clear understanding that uh, the difference between for the implementation or our operation of any project, you, there's an understanding about the infrastructure that is needed for the data collection. In, however, the understanding of 
like the amount of data or the amount of information that it is needed to support the goals of the particular project is not entirely clear. And as such, when you receive all this data, you need to ensure the data readiness of this data to ensure that it provides the, the information that it is needed. Uh, for example, uh, um, there are many things that one can do as part of the data readiness procedure. In part of the documentation, okay, you need to see it, like what are the actual sources of the data, where it was produced, how does it relate to the different components or the procedure to be uh, monitored? Is it actually numerical or categorical data? Uh, a lot of times you can see like, okay, we are measuring the, the overshoot of this process. And you get a number like 50, but those 50 means it's an 50 with a unit like uh, amperes or voltage, or is 50% with respect to what? Uh, you need to be aware of the resolution, like, okay, is this something that I will be getting only once a day, or is it something that I'm getting this quite often? That kind of information is just important to know, so you can be aware of what you need to have or how you can use it in as for part of the goals. If you had one data measurement that is available only once per day, you will not be able to do predictions that are shorter than one day. Now, also we need to be able to deal with the imperfections on the data. There's always missing data outliers In actually this can be just an entire topic of research by itself. But it is important to be aware of this because if you are not using the data or you are not aware of these imperfections, you might have to create or develop wrong conclusions. Uh, you're seeing always a 99 in the value. You were like, okay, this is perhaps 99%, but perhaps that 99 was a, someone who decided along the way that represents a NA as 99 rather than NAs because a system could not handle NAs. So that's, that's little details that it may look insignificant. A lot of times requires a lot of time for investigation. Now, we all have here, perhaps we have all here that data can be dark, in meaning that most of the data actually is unexplored, untaped. There's large potential of this data, but we need to be able to understand the meaning behind it. Unfortunately, uh, most of the domain experts are not data scientists. If data scientists are not domain experts. So it is quite important that there's this communication from both sides. So it can leverage the knowledge from the domain experts when manipulating in dealing with the data. And one can extract the useful information of what it is, what is the relevant aspects and this needs to be a feedback loop, so it can be mutually beneficial for, for both sides. Now, then there is the issue of, uh, we will say data fusion. Data, it might come from many different sensors, places, and unfortunately not a lot of times it is not stored on the same place. In actually within the same large organization, different groups might be responsible for different silos of data. So one needs to be able to, to, to leverage and be able to clean, remove the noise all around when trying to merge all these different sources of data. And one might realize that the amount of data that was in one group is not equal to the, the amount of data in the other group. So creating this sort of imbalance uh, which certainly needs to be deal with. So here's where access rights, it certainly plays a role. So what we want to invite is to see data, not as the goal, that's a gold mine. Why? Because there's plenty of potential out of it, but one needs to go and look for it, look for it. So the insights, the information of what it is absolutely useful out of it, that will be the goal. But the data by itself is just a goal, Mike. Now, 
All organizations in we in that includes us, Viking Analytics, we want to become better at extracting this gold. And we want to support the tools to generate and extract these goals. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of times, a lot of times it, it is invested on extracting it and cleaning up preparation and actually just creating the model in deploying this mo the, the generated models might not take as much time as all this data preparation. So we need to manage these insights, manage uh, what it is needed to generate this, this data. So one can define the process more easily, the tools more easily, and make this data easily accessible. So there's more time and opportunity to explore across different models and bring greater value to the uh, uh, organization. Thus, we believe that dedicated time to data exploration is really important when initiating and working on any machine learning or deployment process to foreign organization. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your time. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sergio. And, and you were just mentioning that with digging and looking at the data. So your vision is really to help your customers um, use their manufacturing data. And when you talk to your customers, how many of them or, or what's your impression? Are they ready uh, to use the data or do they need a lot of help to kind of uh, get going? <laughs> Well, we had seen all different cases in many different organizations. A lot of the organizations are quite ready. Just they already had their software team with an API. You can access, download, and everything becomes quite, quite easy. And at the same time, we had been approached with some other customers in which what we the way to get the data is to go with a USB across each of the machines in, in because there is not a connection to it. So there is a broader range of opportunities and organizations in the way in which they handle the data. And that's another challenge by itself. OK, thank you. And, and so you are a data scientist. Um, are you working mostly with uh, your customers' data scientists? Or who are your main point of contacts? Uh, a lot of times, uh, many customers, they don't even have their own data scientists. So a lot of times we work quite closely with the domain experts. So we can, with their tools, we can help in generating what they are doing. And actually what we are, that's what we are striving, closer collaboration with their domain experts. Why? Because we see many of these industries that there's greater demand of, uh, of for them about what they need to produce to review. But the resources that they had available, either uh, personal or people resources, but machine resources are rather limited. So we, we work quite closely with them so we can help them to, to generate as much knowledge in production without having them to invest so much time in people into it. That's great. Yeah. Do you have a... um, no, I've been following Viking Analytics since it started from mm -hmm. from um, from from a distant Chalmers, and I, I think it's super interesting to see, and, and it's fun to see the team grow and expanding into other types of customers. But what do you see, Sergio? What is the main challenges when when you are starting to work with the corporates? Well, there are certainly many challenges, but I will say as part of the the. Well, the major challenge is a lot of times the, as it relates to data, these access rights. Why? Because as I said, there's data collected across different groups within the same organization. There's the agreements in there's like, okay, we had access to this data, but it turned out that there's other data that is part of the other organization in or another group within the same organization, but the procedure, it is a little bit different. So it's arranging all these logistics around it that sometimes takes uh, quite a bit of time. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I think we'll spend some time during the panel to discuss just that and uh, in, in how we can do it easier and mm. more smooth or more agile uh, so that we can get going faster. Because everyone that's here, I, or I, and my, my belief is that everyone that's here want to apply AI to solve or want to apply machine learning to solve a lot of challenges. So, Sergio, thank you so much. And we will see you uh, in just a couple of minutes again. Yes, see you in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. And we would like to welcome Alexander Kukresh from uh, DocuSign. Hi, Good morning. Everyone. Morning. Uh, Good to have you here on, on Partner Week. And yeah. uh, we look really much forward to uh, hearing your perspective on the data challenge. Um, so please go ahead and, and uh, share your screen and start whenever you feel ready. We'll let you know when we can see it. Yes. Do you see this? Yes. Yes. Hi. Yes. Nice. So, uh, my name is Alexandra Kukrish, and today uh, we will talk about data traceability as a challenge and a value. And uh, the agenda for today uh, first, I will introduce my company, and we will talk about data we work with and what challenges we have. And the rest of the presentation will be focused on data traceability, uh, what tools and methods uh, we use to address this problem, and what is the benefit of having data traceability at your organization. So, as I mentioned, I work in for DocuSign, but our Gothenburg office is formerly known as Seal Software. In May, it has been acquired by DocuSign. And historically, a SEAL was built to make finding, analyzing, and extracting data from contracts uh, simpler and faster. And today we are trying to integrate our AI solutions to the digital agreements provided by DocuSign company. Uh, but uh, what does it mean to make contract review easy and simple? And I would like to give you a practical example uh, that we work with one of the use cases. Uh, our end users are in-house lawyers, uh, procurement managers or contract managers that have thousands of contracts in their system. And let's see, uh, let's for example, uh, you, uh, uh, look to, to this use case where the lawyer needs uh, to mitigate risks, uh, for example, related to supply chain in COVID times. And uh, there is a request, find the contracts with company A, which have force majeure clause related to COVID with termination date within the next three months. Uh, how do we, uh, how can we address this uh, use case? And actually, uh, as machine learning team, uh, we break this request into several points. And um, our task is to build machine learning model that will classify uh, the corresponding language uh, to the corresponding uh, legal concepts. And here uh, we will find several models that will classify, for example, some uh, uh, language as contracting parties, or maybe we, we have to find uh, the sentence that refers to termination date or contract term. So in the end, uh, the system with uh, many contracts uh, has a machine learning pre-built um, models and other NLP solutions that automatically detects uh, different pieces of the contracts. And the end user can uh, manipulate uh, with, and uh, play with the search engine uh, to find uh, the contracts that meet uh, uh, the requirements. And of course, this makes the contract review process easier and faster. And you have to take into account that it's not one contract, it's like thousands of contracts. And here, of course, there is a big win for our end users. And this is what we are really do. And um, so from this small uh, overview of uh, use case, you can see that we work with the text data and this te uh, text data is legal. 
uh, it is both a raw and labeled data that uh, are present in business contracts. And of course, working with such uh, type of data is very challenging because it, it requires legal domain knowledge. We also uh, have shortage of label data. It's very expensive, time consuming, but also raw data is not available, especially if we talk uh, about other languages that in English, for example. So here is uh, the reason the here is a list of all many challenges we face. But I will focus today only on data addressability challenge. And why? Because um, addressing this challenge helps to address other problems we have with the data. And I will talk about this later. So uh, what is data traceability? Uh, it's quite simple thing. Uh, it is the capacity to follow the life cycle of data to track all access and changes to the data. And uh, the necessity of uh, having this in place in our organization was uh, driven both internally and externally. In the team, we had a data vision and the main goal was to create a system, data system that will enable us to understand better our data to, to have tools that will enable us to find and collect data easily. And also uh, we needed uh, tools and uh, methods uh, to, uh, to improve our data continuously and uh, uh, reuse it in models because we deploy models into the production and we need to have reliable and trusted ways to reproduce uh, models all the time. But also it was driven by business needs, uh, for example, uh, because of compliance rules or because of the request by customers to follow the, how their data is used. We also were driven by a uh, growing number of use cases we needed to address all the time. So um, uh, when we talk about data traceability, it comes to um, two major components. It's about where and how. And where refers uh, to the origin of your data. What is the source of the data? And how refers uh, to how the data was manipulated and transformed. But usually it is not limited to these two dimensions. It, it can come to much more questions about your data. For example, what, why, when, and who. And um, for example, uh, what uh, uh, refers to uh, what <clears throat> privacy uh, access level data has, why we store this data, when it has been created or collected, who has created uh, this data. And in order to, uh, to answer these questions, of course, you need to have tools and processes and uh, I will show you the example that uh, we use in our organization. The major part of uh, this is infrastructure. And in our company, we have a data lake, data warehouse and tools that helps us to move uh, data around these points, storage points. We also need uh, to govern this infrastructure and we do this through metadata and data catalogs. We have technical metadata that is captured automatically and we also have so-called business metadata that is manually created. And of course, to have uh, uh, this all in place requires policies because we, we need to use these tools uh, in the right way. And uh, we have data curation guidelines, we have uh, <clears throat> training uh, data policies, and we need to adapt this all the time across the organization. So here, the example of a data curation workflow we have, and um, this is like uh, our experimental pipeline that we use uh, to build uh, and ex to build models and experiment with data. And uh, here you can see that 
uh, the landing point for any data coming from different sources is a data lake. And uh, you can see that we have here very different formats of text data and data lake is uh, structured and organized uh, and we also have metadata that describes our data from the business perspective for example uh, uh, industry domain contract type uh, and so on and also we have uh, technical metadata uh, file size uh, for example file format and so on uh, then we have seal system that we also use as a tool uh, for data transformation and processing. And the example of uh, data transformation is uh, data annotation. And then we have a data warehouse where we store the processed labeled data. And we move uh, the data around these properties with ETL tools, extract, transform, load tools. And metadata, each time we move data, we store metadata in Elasticsearch. And this flow enables us to match our process data with the source uh, uh, data in Data Lake. Uh, since in Data Warehouse, we have uh, data stored in text files and the view of the data in the end is very different from what it has been in Data Lake. And then we can use uh, data, label data in our experimental pipeline or in uh, the production. So feels like it requires a lot of effort to build all these systems. However, uh, today we can probably say that for us, this system, uh, of data traceability and data management is a real value and asset since we can really trace back our process data to this to the origin uh, source of the data and we can really uh, can answer many questions uh, for example, what raw data was used? Does it address use cases we deal with? What uh, uh, domain has been presented? Is our training data uh, covers all use cases we need? We can uh, do a root cause analysis if we deal with the data quality problem. And we also can um, verify the differences in labels, for example, and it's not the full list of what we really uh, can do with this system. And uh, yes, I have mentioned that data traceability is a challenge and it's, uh, it's, it's, it requires a lot of work, both from engineering side and business side. It requires some vision. And uh, if you have infrastructure metadata, data policies, and if this all uh, is used in a right way, then it's, it's a real asset for the organization. And when we talk that we have a lot of data, uh, it's one thing, but when you have all this in place, then uh, the statement that we have data is very powerful and it is a trusted asset and we can really comply with any requests from customers, any le legal regu regu regulations requests. We can also do analysis on our data quality problems. We can reuse the same data in a trusted, reliable way. And we can use all the system to manage our models and continuously improve it and deploy into the product. And um, I believe that although the effort is needed, it is, it is valuable to get this in place. And I hope that I gave you some motivation to think of this. So thank you very much. And maybe we will see later. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, really great. And I think it's also wonderful to, to have a company like Seal uh, that is originally from, from Gothenburg uh, being acquired by a huge company from San Francisco and actually leave in the AI department. And that was why you were 
purchased and, and leaving that in Gothenburg. It shows a real strength of the development that's going on uh, here in Sweden and in, in Gothenburg. And it's wonderful to hear your presentation about the challenges that you are tackling. And I'm myself a lawyer, and I think it's great to see these tools that can be used for legal tech and and looking through these agreements and i saw some notes about the efficiency that you can actually gain uh, from using such tools and it's just uh, amazing to hear actually i would like to add that in the acquisition process all this data system that we have had a great value as well because it's it's a really asset right now i think yeah Thank you for, for sharing that. And we will now like to welcome the other panelists uh, back. Um, so please turn on your cameras and unmute yourselves. And I think we can kind of stay on that topic because I think it's really interesting. You all represent different organizations. And uh, from Alexander's part, for example, of course, you also need a lot of data to develop your product. And I could see how that could be a challenge and uh, at some point, maybe you are also um, able to use the data from your customers. But would you elaborate a little bit on that, Alexandra? Like how to get that access to the data needed for, for the development of the product? Well, uh, in general, we have a policy to use public data for training uh, machine learning models. But initially, when we have started like 10 years ago, it was allowed to use customer data at that times because the rules were not that strict. But now we use only public data. And uh, with English, it is more or less uh, possible, but with other languages, of course, we have uh, difficulties. And one of the way to address this is transfer learning. Um, so, and we use this as well. Uh, so uh, the rest sources of public data, but uh, of course this data is raw. So we use our own capacities to label this data. And actually, I have also background in, in law. Um, I'm a lawyer. So, so I bring some uh, legal knowledge as well to this process. So uh, X is a really a problem, but um, there are tools to address them. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you so much. And I think you're also touching on something that we want to get back to in a minute or two, uh, the connection between the legal aspect, aspects and the technical aspects. But I would uh, just like to ask the same question to Sergio from Viking Analytics, for example, developing another tool. Also, uh, how have you been working with finding the right data to create this predictive maintenance tools that you work with? And are you working on pilots with your customers or so we, well, we work quite closely on pilot projects with our initial customers. And in the main goal here is actually just creating the tools that enable them to better use the data rather than having data so we can develop our tools. That we, that's the reason we focus in a lot on unsupervised approaches with active, active learning methods in which Okay, we get the feedback from the user, we get the feedback from the domain experts, and we want to integrate that knowledge. So in, when dealing with the models, it is quite robust to the many characteristics of the data, rather than having something that is entirely dependent on a specific kind of data set under specific circumstances, which might be really good for one person or one customer, but then again, it's it is not as scalable to be used across many different organizations. Oh. Um, and, and Daniel, um, you are doing the same, but you're, you're also helping and pushing the field of, of federated learning. Uh, what's your experience? Uh, the, the, your, the topics you uh, usually discuss during uh, keynote speaks are, are the data access challenge. Uh, do organizations yeah. understand this? Yeah, yes and no, because we also see that there are two kinds of organizations maybe. Because so in some cases, this fundamental data access in the data pipeline is a big issue. So labeling, annotating, getting all the data in one place. But if you do have that in place, so you have an automated approach, everything in place, then it's a matter of uh, like using the data that you have. So in many cases where we have been involved, 
if you have a device maybe, so the absolutely first step of your process is to throw 95% of the data away because you're just generating too much data that you cannot handle. So, uh, and I think that that's also an aim that maybe like what we're talking about here is what you, where you should be aiming at. How do you create an automated data pipeline so you can uh, really have a scalable way of using all the data that you're potentially can be both generate and use. Yeah. So I, I would say just yes, aim high, like aim for full automation, then you will get, uh, and in many cases have all the data that you would like to have. Then, then the this data access and how you can use the data becomes more of a challenge. Yeah. And you were also uh, touching on something there, Daniel, that uh, Mats, for example, brought up in his presentation about that you're collecting so much data that it, you actually don't need. So much. Do you want to fill in something on this uh, discussion about the data and the accessibility of it? No, yeah, but I, I think that uh, that's really true. What what Matt said that uh, many organizations. So when you start to work with this, so it takes a time to get going. But then then when you get your processes and and pipelines in place, then you start to generate a lot of data, and and it becomes more a matter of how to figure out how to use all of that data as, as best as you can. And many times that might be what we're sort of introducing here, pushing out the learning. So how, how do you learn from data, not only collecting all the data? How do you push out and learn from data where it's generated so you can handle these like large amounts of, of data in a good way? Thank you. And um, so Alan, you were also touching on this subject, having a lot of data, but that is not necessarily AI ready. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Like what's what the resources needed, for example? Love to elaborate on that. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of a, a crusade that I'm on. I have, a, I have a slightly alternative viewpoint on this that's a little bit more reductionist uh, like everybody else has been talking about uh, just taking all the data you get and trying to put it into some sort of format and then using it I prefer actually to design data for AI uh, so rather than attempting to sort of use the data that we already have, I often find it's more productive to build a system from the ground up that is going to feed an AI with a specific data set. Uh, and and we, can, we can generate a lot of data. Like I can put a plate full of cells in a microscope and, and build you a data set with 300 million data points in a, an hour. <laughs> you know, like, like we, can make, we can make enormous amounts of data. Um, but my experience with the AI is often that, you know, we, we generate the data and we give it to data science people and, and modelers and this sort of thing. And they iterate a little bit and they come back after a month and they say, uh, it, it would be really a lot better if, if it was like, like this. And then I go back and I make it like that. And then they go away for a month and they come back and they say, oh, I think it would be better if it was like this. And gradually we, we I call it sort of co-evolution that the, the data and the AI models co-evolve to a point where they're uh, capable of collaborating optimally, if you want to use that sort of metaphor. Um, and, and I think that's really interesting. I think it's a discipline within a, a sort of sub-discipline of data science that doesn't get a lot of love is, is the, the skill associated with making data, like designing experiments, designing the data in a way that is optimal for AI, rather than trying to bend around these enormous quantities of data that some customer might have, but was never intended for AI and, and might be useful for that, but it's not, it's, it's often very inefficient in, in my experience. And so we've, we've put an awful lot of effort into um, putting biologists together with data scientists for long periods of time, like like months, years, and just iterating around on these sorts of problems, and it's quite it's quite illuminating actually, both for the data scientists and for the the people making the data. Yeah, 
and, and we saw that in, in the questions and Mats, you answer in the chat, but, but there's also a point where uh, we want to bring up the, the need for domain specialists, the need for data specialists and the need for ML or, or AI specialists. So, so it's really about the intersection between these three uh, or, or even four circles where we also add the business perspective in, in okay, what type of value does this create uh, that uh, we from an AI Sweden uh, standpoint or, or perspective are starting and, and we've already started to share and, and talk a lot about that we need to get these three or four competences together to really accelerate applied AI. And I also want to say that lawyers are good to bring yes. in early in the process. And I think Alexander might also agree on that. The sooner, the better. Yeah. <laughs> no, so there's a lot of competences uh, required, obviously. And I guess there are different ways to go about how to, to create those competences within your organizations. Maybe you don't have everything within your organization. Uh, and then maybe you have to go look elsewhere um, to find that. But then AI Sweden could be one way to help. And we also want to, of course, uh, help Sweden um, create some talents uh, within our organization that we can then afterwards yeah. send out to our partners uh, to work yeah. for the organizations. Yeah. Uh, but I saw Sergio, you were nodding a bit when you heard uh, Alan's uh, take on, on uh, this, how to create the data needed. Did you want to just to respond or say anything to that? Well, I, I completely agree with Alan, Alan's view. In I think a lot of organizations uh, could benefit for, from such an approach. It's certainly a challenge for many of them. Uh, in the, taking aside, I guess much of it depends on the perspective, especially larger organizations that they had about data. If it is either a cost or a service, if you start to see it more like a, as a cost, then you just start to produce it in everything. There's not a motivation behind it why we are creating this data. And we had seen a lot of times in which like, okay, we want to store as much data as possible. And, but it is a process in which it is rather constant the entire year around with no change at all. And in that case, it's like, what is the purpose of something like once every 30 seconds, in the value will never change in the entire year unless there is a problem. Uh, and that's one of the phases that we, we see around that you just want to generate the data, but it is like never thoughts about like, okay, how we will want to use that data. So I completely share Alan's view about that need of many organizations to think about that. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, and I think uh, we want to jump on that you know, regarding competences, but also, uh, Mats, from, from a Sensac point of view, how, because uh, we got a, a question here in the chat, uh, what do you see as the go-to method uh, in the near future for traceability uh, in terms of, of data and learning? Hmm, I think I'll take the more general approach rather than the narrow Sensac approach um, on that one. But in, in general, I think the most um, widely used approach for addressing that question is, is to employ blockchains in, in one way or another. <clears throat> and, and that, um, if you don't know what it is, uh, it, it's uh, a lot of literature available on this <clears throat> and it's a pretty well developed technology. So it's something that's rather readily available and it, I think meets all the needs that, that you might have on, on traceability and integrity and uh, encryption and also uh, sort of history of how data has been used over, over time. Yeah. So, so that would be my recommendation to take a look at that. Yeah. And I would like to direct the same question to Alexander uh, with the traceability and, and uh, using different techniques. Um, do you, because the question is really, um, do you see this as a go-to method in the future, maybe using federated learning or um, um, blockchain, uh, for example, technologies? Well, in our case, uh, it is much simpler uh, uh, task because uh, right now we use only uh, public data as a source for our training data. And uh, we use uh, data traceability as um, a method uh, to uh, track data quality problems and also just to evaluate um, whether we covering all the possible use cases. So it's uh, from the compliance uh, point of view, we are quite, quite on the quite safe uh, side 
because of the, our, our policies. And it's like, we use what is allowed to use. But internally for us, it's more the tool uh, to help us to improve our models and to reuse the data in a trusted way. Uh, so, but I agree that uh, if the compliance question is very uh, important for the organization, it might be worth uh, to have more advanced uh, methods to trace your data. Um, and blockchain is one of the examples, but I'm not sure how easy to implement this in, in, within organizations, because according to our experience, it took quite time to put all these pieces into the place. And data traceability is one of the small aspects. So having this infrastructure uh, gives you even more, be uh, more benefits rather than just data traceability. But in our case, it's, yes, uh, right now we have like a very strict rules in terms of what data we use and it is a public data. So it's not that important in terms of from the compliance point of view. Yeah. Thank you. And I think just uh, with the traceability and also uh, with regards to we've mentioned some of the legal aspects here and, and GDPR's requirements, for example, to, to show transparency in automation decision making, for example. But that's probably a discussion that we can bring up in, a, in another session mm -hmm. because we're actually uh, already at 9.30 yeah. and uh, about uh, to head into the networking session really soon. Yeah, but what we want to end with, because we want to be hands-on and, and have clear action points. So what I want to ask all the, the panelists uh, here are, what do you want to see happening within the Swedish AI ecosystem within the coming uh, 6 to 12 months? And I would like to start with you, Daniel. Yeah, so I think we have started really good because it is a, to get really anywhere with, with AI projects, we need to have a combination of many different um, uh, specialities. So we need domain knowledge, we need access to data, we need technical implementations. So, yes, so, so finding ways to collaborate and like finding each other also, uh, that's I think is one of the most important things. Thanks. Yeah, great. And Sergio? Well, uh, I agree with Daniel, uh, creating these synergies across the different organizations, both from the startups, but even from the larger organizations, so we can better understand the challenges in the capabilities that they had. The startups, we had larger flexibility in quicker experimentations, but larger organizations had greater capabilities in the sense in which they had a proper infrastructure for how to store the data. So creating these links to, to on communication so we can get both sides will create greater empathy for both. Yeah, yeah. And Alan? Uh, could you just repeat the question again? Yeah, so, so we want this, there to be clear action points. So what do you, would you like to see happening within the Swedish AI ecosystem within the closest or the coming six to 12 months? Yeah, okay. Uh, the, I think one of the big deals for us is that um, we need to get people who understand AI better and what it can be used for. And I'm talking about people who know nothing about AI, who are not yeah. data scientists and this sort of thing. So, so communicating better how to use AI, when to use AI, what it can be used for, what sort of data is, is necessary, I think is interesting. Another thing that I think would be really interesting is small data. Uh, so for example, just uh, we have a, an ongoing project with one-shot learning, we call it. Uh, and if I, if I show you this cup, uh, all of you can go off and find more cups. None of my AI systems can do that. Uh, and what we want to do is, is, for example, in the context of our microscopy, is have the user point at an object in the picture and say to the microscope, go and find the rest of these, please. One object, yep. not thousands and thousands of things that you train networks with and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, so so these, these kinds of uh, applications, I think, are, are interesting because, or these kinds of thoughts are interesting because they will put the power of the AI into the hands of the scientists to a greater extent. Uh, and, and that's another sort of crusade that I have is, is um, uh, enabling the use of AI. Uh, yeah. in, in, and I, I would like to see that happen. Yeah, 
And I definitely think that we can stand behind teaming up with you in your crusades. Uh, so let's go together. Uh, Alexandra, how about you? Actually, I agree with Alan about small, small data problem. We have this as well. And also looking for one shot learning solutions. It's quite right now trending, I would say. But also like the company that works with the text data, we believe that it is quite challenging type of data. So it would be nice to have a collaboration with the companies that do the same work we do and share our capabilities and experiences. And also I agree that uh, the general education about uh, AI is very important and vital part because I believe that uh, business side of AI is very important. So it's, it's a lot of like ooh, people who are working in machine learning with data, uh, they have solutions sometimes, but these solutions are not used properly with business people who take decisions. And to build this bridge is very important as well. Because uh, for example, in our case, we work with different business stakeholders and it's really hard to move uh, these solutions further because there is no clear understanding of the value for business people. And this is kind of a challenge to, to communicate these things. So yeah. it might be good to, to focus on this area as well. But I know that the third day will be devoted to business side of AI and it is great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great. And, and Mats, I will give you the final wor word here. Okay, thank you. I, what keeps me up at night is the, the ones that we're missing here. And I think that drives back to, to a little bit of what Alan was pointing out too. As you can see here in the attendance here and the membership of AI Sweden and so forth, we, we have the startup companies, they're, they're clearly going after AI. We have the big companies that are big and are also going for it. But then we have the companies that are in between. And they include companies who are suppliers to uh, the big companies. It includes uh, smaller stores and smaller um, businesses out in the country, in the smaller villages and, and even the bigger villages, different shops, different things like that. Uh, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the experience, they don't have the engineering, they're not a startup, uh, and they are critically affected by AI. It could be even a hairdresser who can sort of come up with new hairstyles and so forth. Now, how do we get these guys into the AI era and make them use it? So I think we need to find a way here jointly between the startups and the big companies to work with our uh, supply base let's say in the uh, out in the country for the for the automotive and electronic industry and so forth but also to work with uh, the smaller shops and it could be anything from veterinary clinics to to who knows what i think that is the opportunity and it's not hard to do it and get traction and and to get results within six to twelve months and it could have huge value to smaller companies and to business yeah Great remark, and it's important that everyone is on board. Uh, we got a, a commentary or a quote from, from Sweden Innovation Days, which, which uh, said that, okay, partnership is really the new leadership in, in terms of driving innovation and driving industries, but then we need partnerships all across the, the operations. So we, we can't just do startups and, and the big corps. We need everyone in between. Uh, so, so great, Mats. Uh, panel? Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing all of your knowledge and all of your insights. Uh, this is really fruitful. And to uh, the attendees uh, watching this, uh, please reach out. Reach out to us and reach out to the panelists because that's why they are here. They are here to, to help you accelerate applied AI. Um, Eba, what's yep. your key, key takeaways from, from today? One of my great takeaways is really collaboration, as we said. Collaboration to be the new leadership. Um, what Alan has showed with uh, the challenge and the hackathon, how that could actually accelerate uh, the teamwork and how it spreads knowledge and also how it can actually benefit the one who is sharing that data. Yeah. I think that's really one of my key takeaways. And I think all of the other panelists has in one or other way uh, just confirmed the same, yeah. that this is something that needs to happen. Yeah. That's great. And, and as Alexandra mentioned, uh, this is why we have these three days. Uh, today we focus on, on the data because uh, the Venn diagram is my, one of my favorite new models. But, but the Venn uh, in the Venn diagram, we uh, communicate right now. The, the data is one part, and then we have the domain expertise or, or the business, and then we have the tech in terms of, of AI expertise or uh, our machine learning expertise. Uh, so 
today was the data day. Tomorrow we'll be talking about uh, more about the tech and machine learning and, and also more federated learning. Uh, it will be a topic and edge as well. And then on Thursday, we will have the, uh, the business day. And this is hugely important as all of the panelists say that we get the, the business people and the domain experts together to really help them understand how they can use uh, AI to create value within and without uh, or within and also outside of their organizations. Mm. So uh, to the panel, thank you so much. Ebba, thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. And just before we wrap up, I just wanted to say that the panelists, or some of you will at least uh, stay on for the networking session yeah. that will start just right now. Yeah. And I also want to mention that we in the chat uh, have posted a link to the Data Bakery workshop yeah. that will take place actually right now at 9.45. Yeah. But this is a concept with one of yeah. our partners, Smarter, and it's something that we will probably do in the spring again, where you can, uh, it's a workshop about how to find your data, how to connect your different parts of your organization to see what you have and to start your data driven journey, yeah. so to speak. So within five minutes, uh, quarter to 10, uh, the Smarter Workshop will start. And then we will open up the, the networking session or the connecting session in just a minute after answer uh, or closing down this session. And the link to the networking session is now in the Zoom chat. So, so please use that. And we will be back here from tomorrow uh, at 8. Then I will be joined by Eric Wilson and, and Chital Reddy, and we will talk about the tech part. So I hope to see you all tomorrow and have a great day. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you very much.